Well, as our drug approval agency, the Therapeutic Goods Administration prepares to make its decision on which vaccines will be rolled out to Australians in the middle of next month, it's now sought urgent information from Norwegian scientists after the country reported the deaths of 30 frail and elderly people who'd taken the Pfizer vaccine. Meantime, US intelligence sources are claiming that the virus may have first infected humans as early as spring, that's in our season calendar, in 2019. That's months before we were told anything about a virus coming from Wuhan. To explain all of this, I'm joined now by Dr Paul Griffin, Infectious Diseases Director at the MARTA. Paul, welcome back. Thank you. Thanks for having me. So how concerning are these reports of 30 deaths, considering the fact that in a normal year, as I understand it, in the same time period, up to 400 frail and elderly people would lose their lives in aged care facilities? Look, that's exactly right. I don't think it's concerning. I mean, I think the TGA and other regulators need to do their due diligence and ensure that these deaths weren't in any way related to the vaccine. But that's what I expect will be the outcome of that. And I think what we're seeing is just how good it is that we continue to observe what happens to people after they've received the vaccines, even after they're approved, so that we can make sure that there are no serious effects that pop up that weren't discovered in the clinical trials. So I think this is a good thing that this has been reported. We need to make sure it's not related. And that's what I expect to be the case. So people need to not be alarmed. Yeah, because we've gone through the UK experience over the past six weeks where millions of jabs have been given, millions. And we haven't seen any similar correlation or data of this sort, have we? No, that, that's exactly right. It's really important to point out that the clinical trials were done well in large numbers, and now we've seen millions of people receive these vaccines, and we just haven't seen any significant safety signals, but we are continuing to monitor. We've seen these unfortunate deaths in this cohort, which are probably unrelated, but it's been reported, it's being investigated, and so we'll know for sure they're, they're not related. And if the vaccine's approved here, we can be very confident that it's the right thing to do to go and get it. And the important thing now is you don't want people to hear the current news and not have a full explanation down the track. Like, if the explanation is that there's really no correlation between the vaccine and their health status, that they would have died in a short period of time as it was, or they haven't died as a result of the vaccine, you've got to be able to get that out there because a story like this today can take the gloss off people being willing to take a vaccine, right? Right. Yeah, that's exactly right. I mean, my understanding is these were people that were over 80 years of age with comorbidities, so their life expectancy, irrespective of their receipt of the vaccine, was relatively short anyway. And But as I say, we're doing our due diligence now. We're making sure this isn't related, and if that's the case, we'll obviously continue. And, you know, it has to be said that the regulators over there are having a good look at it. Obviously, the manufacturer is having a good look at it, as well as our regulator. And it's in no-one's interest to, to conceal any of these things. It's been reported, so it can be investigated, and so transparency is a really key factor here. And as I say, if it's uh, approved here, it'll definitely be the right thing to do to go and get it. Yeah. I want to talk about some of this intelligence coming out of the United States where we have some information, not confirmed, of course, you'll get nothing confirmed from the Chinese on COVID-19, but some information that suggests that in the autumn, that is the American autumn, so our spring of 2019, there were researchers within that Wuhan Institute of Virology lab who actually had... COVID-19 because they were dealing with a bat-prone virus. Now, would that surprise you? It, it would. I mean, my understanding of that laboratory is it's a very high standard. There's some very reputable scientists that were there, including some that had worked and trained in Australia. So I would find that very surprising. I mean, my understanding was that the Chinese did a really good job of identifying that there was potentially something that was linked. I think they'd learnt some valuable lessons from the first SARS around uh, 18 or 19 years ago, and so investigated this very thoroughly, very quickly, and perhaps found this uh, quicker than we would have found it in other countries that didn't have those processes in place. So, you know, while, again, we certainly need to look and do our due diligence and try and find out as much as possible of the origin so that we can be more prepared perhaps next time, I think we just need to, to wait to see if this is substantiated. But I, I, I doubt that this is something that was around that long before, to be honest. OK. This WHO team, the scientific research team that's inside China at the moment, do you give this... Investi investigation any hope of getting to the origins of the virus? I think it's going to be challenging. I mean, there, there's some excellent people that have uh, made that journey, is my understanding, but I think it's going to be very hard to do this retrospectively. 
So I'm not confident we'll know for sure, but I think, uh, you know, whatever the findings, it's going to be uh, valuable for them to try and get as much information as possible. Quickly about testing. I've heard Mary Louise McClaws, who I've just mentioned, talk about this 15-minute turnaround test that's available, that could be rolled out a little further, that would be really handy to have. Why is there a... Why, why do we have the 24-hour test that is the basis of our testing regime in the country and not a 15-minute one? Well, I think the main thing to say is we've done an excellent job in this country of having availability of a really um, excellent performing test, and that's been a really big part of our ability to keep it under control. I think more testing, though, is going to be beneficial, but I think it's important to point out that, you know, when we do things like make a test that's less invasive or, or faster, often that does come at the, the price of performance. And, you know, with all tests, we need to make sure we evaluate them so that they perform at an appropriate standard. And, again, unfortunately, some of these rapid ones just aren't quite accurate enough. So I think there's a place for rapid tests to be complementary to the existing testing we have, but it's not going to replace the laboratory tests we have that are you know, performing very well. Your thoughts on the New South Wales Premier's suggestion that venues would have to maybe put a few, dangle a few carrots in front of people to take a vaccine and give them something in return for coming to the venue. Do you think we need to do that? Do you think people are going to be a, a little bit apprehensive about taking a jab? I think so, unfortunately. You know, I'd like to think that just making sure people are informed will be enough of an incentive for, for everyone to go and get the vaccine, but I think that's not the reality at the moment. And so anything to try and encourage people to make the right decision to go and get the vaccine uh, will be helpful, I think. As I say, information is going to be the, the best way to try and get people to come and get that vaccine. And again, I'd encourage people to rely on reputable sources of information like the federal and state governments, for example, and, and their GP and potentially pharmacists so that people are informed and can and make the right decision. But, yeah, I think uh, additional enticement, uh, if it helps get the vaccine rates higher, then that's great. OK. Dr Paul Griffin, great to have you on the program once again. Thank you. Thank you.